Um, we're going to provide a, a high-level introduction to, to, to blockchain. And uh, I'm just going to go straight to it. Well, for as I could say, my name is Jorge Martinez. I work in the OICT Innovation Office, um, Innovation Unit, sorry. And so I'm going to go with uh, the presentation that I have. So it's blockchain and cryptocurrencies explained, read in a, for, for normal people. So um, I want to start with an example. Imagine, imagine you are a farmer and uh, in a place like this. So you've, your whole family struggled for, for, for maybe centuries, post-colonial era or, or whatever circumstances to find some land, settle it, and obtain a title confirming that you actually own this land, that you have the rights to farm it and nobody can take it away from you. So you're this person right here in the middle of nowhere. All of a sudden, an earthquake hits you, a landslide, a hurricane, and not only your property is, is lost and you've lost all your assets and you have no way to uh, survive, your livelihood has been uh, lost, but then you also don't have a way to prove that you own that property and that you can get back this uh, uh, property that could be uh, uh, transformed into currency or something that you can use to survive. So what do you do in that situation? So typically the person who is in that situation is dealing with a local registry, but in this earthquake the registry was also destroyed. What do you do in that case? Well, um, maybe um, maybe the country where you were living in uh, had really uh, devoted uh, municipalities that thought that it would be a good idea to have a database or a, or a physical mean to distribute the copy of the land reg registries with other towns. So they were actually sure lucky. This person was a farmer, was really lucky because there were copies of the land registry in other towns. So she's, she's been displaced by this hurricane and she decides to invest the money, take this uh, five day trip to the next uh, town or the next province to confirm that she has a property and she can prove that because she has a piece of paper. And when she, so she takes this long journey to this other place. However, when she gets there, she shows her record and the record now is different. Somebody has been tampering with this information or maybe this information was not uh, up to date. Maybe they had an old, outdated copy of the registry. So, or maybe there was a corrupt official who took advantage of the situation of the earthquake and the hurricane and sold land twice, distributed to people who didn't own that land. Um, so there are all sorts of possibilities why this was the case. So this person is again in big trouble. She's just spent a lot of her money to, just to go to this other town to find a proof of her ownership. So she decides to go to the next town over. And of course, if you can have multiple copies of these, you can um, reduce the opportunities for having fraud. So when she gets there, she finds that there's a copy of her land title, which is, oh sorry, which is um, accurate. So she says, okay, I have proof. My land record here is matched by somebody else's record that is on a uh, government office. So I have, I have proof. But what? They're conflicting, they're conflicting evidence here. So she's gonna spend the next two years of her life trying to go to a court case, if there's a court, to prove which is the right uh, document to prove the ownership of her land. Imagine the municipality had been even more visionary or the country had a good replication system between databases, so there were more copies. That would be fantastic, so she could go to another place and find that there's another copy confirming her information so maybe a court could say, yes, okay, we have two proofs that she owns this land. Okay, finally you recovered your land. But this could take seven years. In the process of these seven years, maybe this, these people, uh, this person ran out of money, she became a displaced person, ended up in a refugee camp forever. Her kids in the meantime didn't have education. So this is something really, really dramatic. And um, this is the type of problems that can be alleviated, not solved, but alleviated by blockchain. And Vanessa is now going to speak, explain a little bit of how, about how. Thank you. So what Roy is describing is essentially exactly how the blockchain works. And another name that's been used for the blockchain has been distributed ledger technology. And I think the simplest way to really understand what the blockchain is is to think about a type of ledger or a type of database. But instead of having everything stored in one place, it's copied across every single person who's part of the same blockchain network. 
So originally the blockchain was created to enable Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency that I'm sure all of you have heard about. So this was the first use case. But the infrastructure, the blockchain infrastructure, that really allowed Bitcoin to happen has been proved to have been incredibly useful in a variety of sectors outside of cryptocurrency. So since what's stored on the blockchain can be anything from currency to intellectual property to personal data, so essentially anything that has value can be stored and exchanged on the blockchain. So if we can go to the next slide, we won't go into too much detail on the, the technical aspects of blockchain today, but we did want to highlight two things right now, that there are different types of blockchains and that there is privacy and transparency built into the blockchain. So briefly, public blockchain is designed to be accessible to anyone at the computer, so it's fully open to the public and fully decentralized. And a private blockchain, in contrast, is a system with controlled access. So participants are really limited to those who have authorized permission. And a consortium blockchain is, is right in between these two poles, and I think is probably the most relevant for today's discussion on how the blockchain can be applied to the UN system. So this is a system where multiple actors or multiple organizations have access to one blockchain network and can store and exchange value. And then for the other features is that the blockchain allows for both public transparency and privacy at the same time. This is a really unique feature that is different from other types of ledgers and other types of databases. So an example you can think of is, think about your home address. So anyone can see your address, anyone can see where you live, but only you yourself who has the key can actually unlock the door to see what's inside your home. So similarly, the blockchain has a header which is transparent and uh, visible to everyone in the blockchain network, but only you with the specific encrypted personal key can open and unlock any information that's stored beneath that level. So in the next slide, you'll see another metaphor for the blockchain outside of the, the home address example is think of a spreadsheet like, like Google Docs. So instead of it being stored on the cloud or in one location, it's duplicated and owned a million times by every single person on the network and is continuously being updated in real time as, as more information is added. So you can always add new rows, but you can never modify a row because you would have to modify every single person's copy, every single person's row at the exact same time, which becomes incredibly difficult as more and more information is being added. So this all sounds good, but does this really apply in real life? So going back to the original example of the land registry, in the, in the next slide you can see that these blockchain registries are, are being implemented in our world today by major governments. So, so Sweden and India are two examples. But again, there are multiple examples outside of land and outside of Bitcoin, and, uh, and Jorge is now going to walk you through an example in the financial sector. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so so um, so then just to, 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 to repeat what Vanessa said, so imagine this blockchain being a spreadsheet that you can all, always append new rows, and anybody in the public can append new rows, but you can never delete them, you can never modify them. So it's a permanent list, a permanent ledger that records transactions, and uh, this is distributed across multiple copies. So um, banks, um, for example, have uh, for forever traded currency. Uh, especially when you're talking about uh, banks that are handling international uh, currency trades. Uh, so Citibank with uh, Societe Generale in France, at the end of the day, after they sold currency, uh, they have an account in each other's bank and they settle it. They say, okay, so many dollars went that way, so many uh, euros came this way, so I owe you this much money, and they send a transfer. And they do this with all the different banks that they do. Citibank does this with, I don't know how many thousand banks, and Société Générale does the same thing with I don't know how many thousand banks. So there's this mesh of transactions that, it, that are happening in all directions, and they're all, trying, they're all trying to settle their balances at the end of the day. It's a very complicated uh, ledger to keep. Essentially, you're keeping so many accounts and you have to balance them all at the end of the day. So these banks, in order to know what's their status of their balance sheet, at the minute, have figured that they can, they can work together and keep a shared ledger in which they are all writing their uh, balance in one single database that is shared. So at all times they can see their balance updated in real time. 
And these organizations are, um, uh, you may be familiar with this organization called SWIFT. This is the number that we use for bank transfer, bank international transfers. So 22 banks, member of this SWIFT, like um, JP Morgan Chase, Deutsche Bank, BBVA, have decided that blockchain is worthwhile investigating to see how they settle these international uh, currency uh, balance sheets. And so blockchain is being used in the financial sector uh, heavily. Uh, it's one of the key, it's one of the key uh, drivers of use. Um, and so now, as a segue, so we, we've spoken of the application in land registry, an application now in the financial sector, which is a consortium of a blockchain. This blockchain is not, this, in this particular application, um, not everyone in the world can read this blockchain, only the members of the consortium. So it's, it's, it's public, but only for a limited audience, it's not for the general public. And um, with that, I'm gonna uh, cover very briefly at a very high level, uh, cryptocurrencies. And by the way, we're having another talk in October that's dedicated just to cryptocurrencies. I hope you, you join if you're interested in that topic. Um, so Bitcoin is one of the largest and most prominent uh, implementations of blockchain. It's everywhere in the news. Um, it's now going through an incredible uh, explosion in popularity and speculation in this coin. But what is it? So I have some notes here, some facts for you to, to, to familiarize yourself with blockchain. So blockchain was uh, invented in 2009, and uh, so it's less than 10 years old. Um, it is a cryptocurrency, it's a virtual currency that's not backed by any physical uh, object. It's not backed by gold. There are no papers that uh, you can pass around as blockchain. It's completely virtual. It's uh, numbers on computers. Um, and uh, the slogan of the Bitcoin.org website, which is uh, uh, hub to learn more about blockchain, blockchain or Bitcoin, describes Bitcoin as um, open source peer-to-peer -peer money. And I think that says a lot about the, the mind frame of the people who are organizing this. Um, Bitcoin behaves in some ways like cash, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. You cannot spend it if you don't have it, and you cannot spend it twice. Once you said this coin goes to her, you cannot undo that. Uh, so it's similar to cash. Um, it's different to cash in the way that every transaction that you conduct, it's written on that ledger, on that spreadsheet that can never be changed. It is always recorded. Um, it is a little bit like cash in the way that it's almost anonymous. When sender A sends a transaction of Bitcoin to, to recipient B, the names of the parties are not written on the blockchain. Only numbers or account numbers that say from account X to account Y. But we don't know who these parties are. Um, so it, it keeps some of the anonymity that cash grants. Um, Bitcoin and other <coughs> cryptocurrencies are in a um, stark contrast to official currencies in the sense that they're not uh, manipulated, they're not uh, uh, regulated by any, by, they're not regulated by a central bank. They're regulated by rules written down in software at the moment, at the moment of the creation of that coin. Um, for example, Bitcoin has when it was created, the, the creator d decided that there were never going to be more than 21 million blockchain. That was a monetary policy created by this program. Um, what did I say? Blockchain. 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 21 million Bitcoin. And that same person also specified what was the rate at which the Bitcoins were going to be generated month by month or every so many minutes. So this person dictated what the typical uh, economist in a regulatory agency for money uh, indicate. Um, so, um, so then it's software specified currency. Um, there are essentially two ways that a normal uh, individual can obtain Bitcoin. How do you first get a hold of a cryptocurrency or Bitcoin? Two ways essentially. You can sign up to an exchange online and uh, buy a cryptocurrency from someone. So you send them an account number, 
some dollars online, and, and in exchange you receive some transactions that are written on the ledger, indicating that you now own these uh, bitcoins. Um, and the other way is a critical component of the blockchain, and it's um, specific to, to Bitcoin, but other implementations of blockchain use the same logic. Um, remember we said that this spreadsheet is copied in hundreds or millions of locations. Remember when um, movies were becoming uh, pirated at large scale and music? There was this tool called uh, BitTorrent that uh, let people send files peer to peer. And one of the components of BitTorrent was that whoever was sharing more data was able to download data faster. There was a social design on this uh, network uh, design that encouraged people to share more and they would benefit from sharing more. So Bitcoin has a similar path. Bitcoin um, is created every so many minutes, every so many, uh, every 10 minutes approximately, there are some Bitcoins that are released. And who can take them? Only computers that are participating to that network and that are providing processing power to run this network. So when there were very few people in the network, it was really easy to connect to this network, your computer, and you waited, and then you obtained Bitcoin just for being a member of it. So more people joined because you could gain this currency that had almost no value at the beginning. And um, so this social uh, engineering uh, is critical to the success of cryptocurrencies, and other cryptocurrencies are doing similar, similar things. Um, finally, um, just to give you a benchmark on the, what Bitcoin where it stands, uh, by 2013, it was invented in 2009. By 2013, it was worth $13. You could convert it for $13. Um, last week, it was more than $4,000. And uh, just as a benchmark, one ounce of gold is $1,270. So this virtual currency is worth more than gold. You can convert for, for more than gold. And um, so it's an extremely creative blend of economic theories with uh, cryptography and with peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, it is decentralized, so you can't kill it. You can't go to one office or one company and say, stop, this is illegal. Because everybody has copies and everybody can run it. So it's it's, it's uh, not only possible, but it's really hard to stop. Um, so it is definitely a disruptive technology that can bring a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of risk. And um, we are, we are um, in the middle of uh, the development of this technology. The, te the technology is not mature, the deployments are not mature, um, and, uh, but countries are adopting legal frameworks to, to treat us either as a currency, as property, as a commodity, or as a financial security. And uh, this, is, this is something that needs to be explored. Uh, Vanessa is going to explore a very interesting case, uh, which are uh, initial coin offerings. And throughout the days, Lambert is going to present how these reflect on the UN system and member states. And Hila is going to present some specific uh, situations in which we've implemented it. And, uh, and then I pass it back to Vanessa. Okay. Thank you. So we want, I wanted to share here an example of how Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are being extended and used. So now that we've discussed a little bit of how Bitcoin works, um, we wanted to introduce this topic of initial coin offerings. This is, this is a topic that's quite under quite a bit of debate these days, but it's a great example of how economic incentives within the Bitcoin and the cryptocurrency space are manipulated and and incorporated into our world today, and it has very real business impacts. So briefly, an initial coin offering, an ICO, is, is almost like an unregulated version of an IPO, except the funds are raised with digital tokens based on cryptocurrency values, such as the value of a Bitcoin, and the money is raised before a prototype is built. So the company will issue a white paper or, or, or an explanation detailing what they're planning to do with the technology. And, and the ICO is used to raise funds directly from peer to peer to build out a concept. And I, I believe there will be a talk later in the day today that will go into more details on an ICO. But this is a really interesting case of how Bitcoin and, and, is, and cryptocurrency aren't just used to to change, to buy things, to exchange value, but it's really being incorporated into existing frameworks of how we 
how we run the economy. And then going to the next slide here, we want to conclude by stressing here that the blockchain is, is a separate but related mechanism from Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So while the blockchain was born out of Bitcoin and used to enable cryptocurrency transfers, there are multiple <coughs> benefits and cases for this technology and, and might have real impacts for, for other sectors that you might not think of, such as the UN system. So in summary, some core benefits we want to highlight about the blockchain are that it's it's distributed, no central body owns the information, it's equally shared among all members within the blockchain because everyone has the exact same copy. And there are lower transaction costs and faster transaction times. Because it's directly peer-to-peer, -peer, you're not relying on a central intermediary or a middleman, there are lower costs and faster times to transfer value within the blockchain. There's also transparency, accountability, and integrity because information is highly tamper-proof, and there is transparency and, and visibility on all the information that has ever been transacted on a blockchain. There's also usage information and traceability, as again, you can see every record that has existed on the blockchain. And, and finally, there's data security through encryption. So th this allows for a degree of privacy, even while transparency and traceability is permitted. So the next talk will really go into detail on what some of the use cases and applications for the UN can be, such as supply chain and digital identities, but we will conclude our, our talk here with, the, with our overview of, of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So thank you very much, and we'll, we'll answer any questions.